To be woke is to be alert and attuned to the layers of oppression in society, generally surrounding the issues of race, sex, gender. It has a long history, although I think a lot of us think of it as being a fairly new movement. The name is new, but it really is a reformulation of old ideas and old roads that various countries have gone down. And I think it's ostensibly a movement for justice, but when you really understand what the internal logic of the movement, it fundamentally is something that weakens people far more than it, it helps, and particularly the people it claims to want to help. So that, this is why I find it to be alarming. I think it's more than just a political movement. It's actually a spiritual movement before anything else. So the history of the movement is really important to understand. I think you can st you can pinpoint it in, uh, in the in a garden with a snake cajoling the first woman to be uh, that she you can be as gods. But uh, I think that we, if we want to specifically plant it, a uh, starting point in modern more modern times, most people point to Karl Marx. But I think it's important also to understand who what Marx was influenced by, and this is a philosopher named Hegel. And Hegel's really important to understand because he started really the engine of the modern progressive movement, which he called the dialectic. And without getting too esoteric, the dialectic was just this idea that history is a, is a movement of progression towards a, a utopian end. And that progression, that progress through history comes through the engine of revolution, which is built around an idea manifesting itself in the state of nature, in the political state in particular, and then that, that's it, that will have contradictions. Those contradictions have to be worked out and worked through, and then you get a new state. And then that state has its own contradictions. You keep cycling and synthesizing uh, in, in the progress of history until you reach that utopia. So Marx was really captivated by this, this thing, this new thing in philosophy under, called the, the dialectic. But he was a strict materialist, whereas Hegel was thinking of this as a rational movement. He really said, no, there is no, nothing beyond the material. The material, material world is all that is. And so there is this dialectic, this engine through, throughout time reaching a utopia, but it's a utopia built purely on economic terms with every person being defined into division as either an oppressor or an oppressed, working class, proletariat, or ruling class. And that this is where the revolution would happen and that the revolution was inevitable. So that, that's sort of the intellectual foundation into this came postmodernism, which basically under, uh, identified language as being avenues for power, and then th therefore we have to be able to manipulate words. And in manipulating our language, we can manipulate the interior life of, of, our, of, our, of a community. Because once we no longer can communicate clearly and understand that our words are connected to reality, then they become tools that we can wound each other with or that we can just destabilize our uh, community with. And then uh, intersectionality came um, and furthered, further centered the oppressive identity. And this one, we really had the birth of identity politics was late 80s, early 90s. And it really crystallized something in the movement. Uh, but but it, the presuppositions are all built on Hegel, Marx, um, Freudianism, and the Frankfurt School. And this is what we see now. This is a mar the march through, through history, the progression into a future utopia that is constantly supposed to be working itself out in time. Um, with rejection of everything that came before it um, is the culmination of, of all of those presuppositions into, into now. Marx said this too, that the greatest obstacles to revolution are two things, the faith and the family. Why? I think because the faith gives people a context for their suffering rather than marinate in the, the inequality or the, um, the cross of our life. We're actually told to embrace that cross, that we can find real meaning and real nobility in, in suffering well our circumstances. But no revolution is born out of people suffering well their circumstances. A revolution is born out of people who are enraged by their circumstances and feel inadequate and helpless to transcend them. So once you are in, in weakened to that point where you feel that you have no power, no possibility, then the only answer left logically is to fight the system, destroy the system, run it to the ground, and hope that something new, some new utopia will come from that. I think the average student at a college, university, or even you know your nice woke Aunt Susan or your neighbor down the street, they are not steeped in Hegel. They don't consider themselves Marxists. And this is part of where the confusion lies, is that it's ostensibly a movement just for justice. And who doesn't want justice? You know, It's a movement that wants to fight racism. Every good-willed, normal, reasonable person wants to fight racism. So there are all of these very you know, deeply actually Christian claims. Christians are supposed to be people of justice, supposed to be people who are fighting against injustice. 
And I think that the fact, the reality that most people would consider themselves Marxist, but have adopted so many of the conclusions of this movement is just a sign of how pervasive and how ubiquitous the movement has become. It's the water in which we swim, it's the air that we breathe, it's in our movies, it's in our stories, it's in the way we frame um, narratives, it's in media, it's in, it's in politics, it's in the academy, <laughs> rampantly so. And so all of these things coalesce to create a default way of thinking, a filter upon which we see the world without even realizing that we're necessarily looking through a filter at all. In some ways, it's sort of spin off the old C.S. Lewis book, The Screwtape Letters, where, wherein he had that famous line that the greatest power the devil, of the devil is that he can convince you he doesn't exist. And therefore, you're at, you're at his mercy and in, in, uh, beholden to his power in a way that you might not have been should you be able to identify what was happening. And I think in some ways, the woke movement is similar to that in the with regard to its presuppositions, that the greatest power this filter, of, this ide ideological filter has over us is that we don't realize that we're looking through a filter at all. And we just think that this is the way that you see reality. So there are certain ways which I think that we can say that most of the people we know who are being caught, caught up in this movement, including you know a lot of Christians, I talked to a lot of Catholics and Christians who feel that, well, Christ would have fought side by side with people for racial justice, or he would have fought against, you know, lecherous men and, and for women who want to be, you know, to feel that they have true dignity and aren't and instruments of someone else's pleasure. Absolutely. There's nothing that is, those are true Christian precepts and Christ would have certainly been on the side of justice in those matters. But the, the thing that ideology does is it's, it's really a true to form ideology in that it takes partial truths and totalizes them. And in that totalization, it presents something that is a lie, fundamentally, because it creates a whole, the only way to look at the world is through this lens of power and domination. Uh, and what, you, what it does is it fundamentally defines a human person differently than what the Christian vision of what a human person is. The Christian vision of the human person is that we're defined on universals. You know, we are, we're rational animals, to use an, you know, just based on Aristotelian logic. But also, through special revelation, we know that we are called to be sons and daughters of a loving father, that we are defined in relationship to God. We're defined by love itself, love himself. The woke define a person very differently and incompatibly. So for the, for the woke, the person is not defined by the love of God, but by the hatred of man or hatred of society. In our very definition is uh, where we sit on the line of, e of the evil of society. So for example, to be a woman is not just to you know, be a woman in any sort of traditional sense, you know, that there's a bodily meaning there and there, there's some certain spiritual, spiritual symbolism. But to be a woman for the woke is to be fundamentally fighting the oppression that's at the core of your being. For example, in 2017, there was the, women's, the first women's march and there was a group of pro-life feminists who were co-sponsoring the march. And when it, the organizers got wind that they were pro-life, they said, oh, well, you can march with us, but you cannot have any official affiliation with us. And, that, and they were confused. They said, but we support you know, the dignity of women. We want to fight for similar goals. You know, we overlap in certain areas. And this is not just a pro-abortion march, it's a pro-women's march. But the thing I think we have to understand about the ideology is that it's not about supporting the person in the, in the, the oppressed group. It's about supporting the person in the oppressed group who supports the ideology. So it's really empowering the ideology, not empowering the human being. So it's not enough to be it's not enough to be a woman. You have to be an ideological woman. You have to be a politicized woman. We hear the same thing echoed with Nicole Hannah-Jones, the author of the 1619 Project, who famously said, we all know there's a difference between being racially black and being politically black, that it's simply not enough to be a black person. You have to be supporting our agenda in order to be considered. So they don't actually want, it's not actually about diversity. It's about uniformity of thought but with different people, representatives of different groups, embracing and affirming that uniformity of thought. So one important thing that I think we need to pay attention to is the way in which words can sound innocuous to our ears, because I think most people translate them into being something reasonable. But for the movement, it's far more radical than I think what we think initially. And a good example of that is the word equity. Equity sounds like something good. It sounds like something that's oriented around justice and equality. But equity for the movement really means one thing, equity of outcome, that all outcomes should be equal, um, despite effort, despite merit, despite any other factor that, you, that might weigh in on uh, disparate outcomes. 
And so if you see that there is an inequitable outcome, you can attribute it, according to the ideology, to only one thing, either racism or sexism or some other type of social oppression. And, and what this does is it really eliminates the possibility of any sort of measure, any sort of metric. So for example, when you hear about the new woke math, and this is a real thing, but they'll say, you know, two plus two can equal five if, there's, if it equals five in someone's lived experience. And I think it's easy for us to laugh at that because there's something on its face just so ridiculous about it. It seems like it can't be a serious proposition that someone is proposing. Uh, but there really is an ideological reason for that, that, the, even the, that all standards have to be eradicated, even the ones that are undeniable as a simple mathematic equation that every person understands to be one thing. And the reason why is because we have to attribute all outcomes, all of our successes, all of our failures to systemic forces outside of ourselves. Our failures are not ours to own and learn from. Our successes are not ours to claim and, and grow with. And, and there's a truth to that, right? Because people do have disadvantages and people do have advantages over others. There's no state force that can equalize all those things. This is the human situation. And, and, our, and our successes are not attributed, do not, do not originate completely in us, obviously. Anything good that comes out of us is first and foremost attributed, attributed to God. And it's just our cooperation with him that, that brings any good in the world from us. So there is a truth that they're speaking to there. But what they do, rather than using it to point to the, you know, the, the love of God and the, the power of God, Rather, it is only an indication of the evil of society. The fact that some people might merit something that others don't is attributed to the systemic forces and the systemic forces have to be eradicated. Other people have spoken on this, particularly notably Jordan Peterson. All of humankind in any society is gonna end up with some sort of hierarchical structure. There's going to be, you know, you see this in all of the, you know, every Marxist country has ever tried to establish uh, a society based on those principles ends up becoming tyrannical. And I think that that's inevitable based on the, the presuppositions. But if you're going to end up in some sort of hierarchical, hierarchical system, no matter what, the, the most fair way to establish that is through merit. I think that it's easy to make merit into a cartoon where people say, oh, just pull your, yourselves up by the bootstraps and without any recognition that people really do start, li start life in situations that they, where we need help. You know, they're vulnerable, they're at risk. You know, there are incredible hardships and, and we can't just, just give them, you know, a good pep talk and say, get on your way. You know, we really need to have solidarity as Catholics. But the problem is, if you read any biography of any person who was born into incredibly difficult circumstances and somehow was able to transcend those circumstances, what was it, what was it that made the difference? It was someone in their life telling them to control what was within their control, to take responsibility, to not marinate in the injustices that they're born into, but rather to see what they can do that can pull themselves out. And you see this in, you know, any, in the biography of Clarence Thomas, um, ben Carson, his, his grandmother used to say, uh, recite a poem to him called Mr. Nobody. And he, you know, it, it was something to along the lines of, you know, when something's gone wrong and you're, you've got no one to blame, who can you blame Mr. Nobody? And the point of this lesson was just that, you know, blame's gonna get you nowhere and you've been dealt a hard, a hard, a hard hand, but that mindset is going to actually exacerbate your circumstances. And, and, and we would never tell someone that in any type to other situation, in leadership, if you're mentoring someone, if you're, um, you know, if you're an uncle or you're an aunt, if you're a boss, you would never tell someone, you know, point your finger at everyone else in the office and see how they're wrong. You know, that person's the last person you want to promote. You want the person who's going to say, the buck stops with me. I'm going to take some initiative and I'm going to, I'm going to grow and I'm going to change. I'm going to see what I can do to make things better and be positive. But for some reason, we've decided that we can tell a whole generations of people that the way that they uh, move through life is the exact opposite way in which is going to lead to their actual, you know, flourishing in life. Knowing how to engage with someone who is woke it can be challenging because in some ways the movement is not or oriented around dialogue really. It's sort of oriented around intimidation. There's a lot of manipulation that happens with language and I think it's important to know when it's not going to be a fruitful conversation uh, and, and you want to just say, you know, I love you, let's not 
enter and let's not go down this road. So there's a certain amount of prudence that comes into the equation. Is this a person that I can actually have a dialogue with? And if it's not, then I, you know, it, it can only create more division and more tension to try to do something that's really not a task that, that this, this combination of people are up for. Um, but there will be other people, I think, who are you know, more open to having a real conversation and with whom we might feel like this is something worthwhile to, to talk about. Um, so I talk to parents a lot who are saying, you know, my, my kids came home and they, they're woke now and they're challenging me. And um, I think it's important to know that this is in some ways a phase. It could be just a phase. It could not be. It could be something that they really adopt lifelong. Um, and I think that there are real woke ideologues out there who are, you know, fully embraced, the, have fully embraced the movement. But there's also a lot of people who are just parroting a script, a script that they've been handed, that's been handed to them. Um, and, and it hasn't really penetrated into their soul. And I think that's when we have to realize that there is a, a deeper human longing that people have. And it's a longing that won't be satisfied by a thin ideology that has to be propped up by coercion, by silencing, by fear, and by manipulation. It's a longing that can only be fulfilled by the fullness of truth, a, a willingness to embrace the truth no matter where it leads you, scientific truth, philosophical truth, theological truth, and most of all, the truth of who we are in relationship to, to a loving God and loving Father. And I think that's what the human heart longs for. And it's something that cannot be fulfilled by, by ideology. And I, and I think that we have to feel confidence in that, that every human person it is, is longing for the exact same thing. Every revolutionary wants to target the father. And I think there's something really deeply spiritual happening there. Because when we think of authority now, right authority, or, or even fatherhood, the role of the father, we, our minds immediately go to tyrannical domination. It's been such an effective um, demonization of that, of the image of a father. But if you talk to someone, they know what a good father should be. They know, even if they didn't experience it, they know that a good father is not there to control them, but actually to empower them to, to lead their lives in, independently. They know a good father is gentle, um, but also strong. And I think we have, so, we have so corrupted the image of the father in a way to corrupt our understanding of who God is, because God is the father. And he's not a father because he's like a human father. Human fathers are more fatherly in, the, in so far as they're more like him. Um, and that fatherhood really is a window into, into who God is. So the, the revolutionaries were, of course, correct. In targeting the father, you really dismantle society from the inside out. Because once, so they wrote about men needing to become licentious, right? To become slaves to their, you know, their desires. That was part of our liberation. Our liberation is through combating groups outside of ourselves, but our liberation is also through combating our own internal desire to, or instinct to repress our, our desires. Uh, and so part of our liberation was in embracing every desire, particularly ones that were transgressive. And so, and this was a real target of men. And what happens then is once a man's moral authority is eroded, then women become vulnerable, you know, because there is a way in which men are called to be pr providers and protectors. And once women become vulnerable, they become, it, they tend to become calloused because the sexual revolution targeted them and it encouraged them to engaged in all sorts of relationships and, um, and activities that women really have to callous themselves to, to engage in because they, they have to develop a thick shell, I think. And I think it's hardened a lot of women it's because they have felt truly used and have felt um, that they weren't cared for. And the, deep, the, the deeper part of, of what's happening, I think, is that think about how the re revolution manipulated this, this societal pathology. It encouraged men to become licentious, to become weak. Um, and then it pointed to the abuse, inevitable abuse and um, disruption that happened between men and women and said, you see, this is further evidence that we need to smash the patriarchy. Men are bad. So let's, let's c c condemn men, men as on a whole as being bad. It's suggesting that the, the cure is the exact thing that caused the problem. Um, that furthering down on rejecting true masculinity is the way that we're going to get out of this hole of having eradicated what real masculinity is. St. Thomas Aquinas says that to be emasculated is to be a slave to your to pleasure to the point where you're no longer willing to suffer. To be a real man, there is some connection between suffering and true masculinity, masculinity that society needs and families need. So I think we're going to have to fight this movement on multiple levels, and it's already happening far more than I think we realize. There are people building up new institutions, 
There are you know, more and more parents seeing through this and we see in our school boards, there's a resistance happening that's very grassroots and, and, and hopeful, I think. You know, I think that people are starting to see through it and there's a thinness to the ideology that is becoming transparent now and people are seeing it affect their kids in such poor ways um, that it seems fundamentally like a justice movement that's actually more unjust than it is just. But I think we have to fundamentally see this as a spiritual battle and, and our fight it on that level, that this is a spiritual battle that we have to be arming ourselves in that way for that fight. But the first thing I, I usually suggest to people is to just wrap your minds around it, understand what it is, get some clarity, because there's a shape shifting of what the move, how the movement presents itself and there's a manipulation of language that happens um, that can be really uh, confusing. And I think that the movement really tries to operate on um, on that sort of confusion and capitalize on it and exploit it, you know, with the with those good Christian precepts, and then it's supplanting them with a bunch of ideology that you have to accept. So the more clarity that we have, then the more we will feel confident, I think, in resisting it and and not falling for these types of tricks. Um, but then fundamentally, I think we have to have courage. Uh, it's, you know, it's a movement that can't be resisted on the fringes. You know, I think one person resisting or two people or a handful of people, that's a fringe movement. But galvanizing whole, you know, whole coalitions of people to resist it, that's something to contend with. And I think that that's the way we fight it within companies and within counties and, and, and even within, you know, our, our country as a whole. That type of clarity can imbue us with a sort of courage that can really give us the, the, what we need, the confidence to simply and plainly call out a lie. And the greatest threat to a lie is some, someone simply and plain, plainly saying the truth. I think it feels like it's Goliath at the moment, but you know, it, 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 Goliath can be brought to his knees far more easily than we, can th we think. Um, and so I, I, I think that can give us a lot of hope in this fight.